Blog Talk Radio. Good morning, good morning out there. Happy December to everybody in Blog Talk Radio land. I want to start with a thought this morning. The past cannot be changed. The future is yet in your power. We have things that happen to us. I know I certainly have. You cannot erase the past. And we spend so much time trying to figure out, what if I had done this? What if I had done that? I mean, I do it too, but you cannot change the past. It's the future that is yet in your power, and the point of power is right now. And you are so blessed to right now be listening to the winning book radio show, Off the Shelf. And welcome to our Saturday, December the 8th show. You you guys, 2018 is wrapping up quick, fast, and in a hurry. So I hope you are on track to reaching your goals for this year, not looking to 2019. You still got time in 2018. What good can you do right now? And today we have an insightful and talented author on deck for you for Off the Shelf, and I am excited to introduce her to you. But before I do, I want to ask you, how much do you love mystery? Our loyal listeners know. Denise does this every Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time when Off the Shelf kicks off. Do you think you can figure out who is responsible for a murder mystery? Who did it? Who did it? to a college, in a college campus, and this murder mystery cloaks Raymond and his friend's life. Can you figure out who did it before it's revealed to you in the book? I also want to ask you, how important is it to you? You do love ro- romance in a novel? Real-life romance, not not is so fixed up that you like, this would never happen to anybody real true romance between two people who are meant to be together and friendships that last a lifetime. But these people go through a lot. Maybe even one of them is responsible for the murder in the story. And then there's a complicated father-son relationship because we are all influenced by our early conditioning, our parents or whoever our caregivers were, Raymond Clark's father has untreated alcoholism, and you can only imagine how that has shaped Raymond. Is he ready, ready, ready to love Brenda? If these types of things interest you, I ask you to click over to Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, eBookit.com. Get a copy of Love Pour Over Me right now. You can get a copy in eBook for $3.00. Love for Over Me by Denise Turney. If you don't see it on the bookstore shelves, just ask the clerk to get your copy of Love for Over Me by Denise Turney, and they can get you order your special copy in print. But it's also available in ebook. Please go get your copy of Love for Over Me now and let me know how you enjoy Love for Over Me. And now let us go and meet our very special off-the-shelf guest. And our special off-the-shelf guest this morning is China Brown. China is a Greenville, South Carolina native. She is employed as a cable company workforce coordinator. I can only imagine how many of her friends and family reach out to her. Can you get me a discount? Mm. <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> is it, can you tell me something, what I can do? Conquering the Storm is China's debut novel, Conquering the Storm, and that takes us back to the past cannot be changed. The future is yet in your power. So she is the author. Her debut novel, Conquering the Storm, writing plays is another creative art form that China loves. And a goal, uh, another goal that China has is that she's pursuing is to become a youth mentor, and we certainly all of us can can do our part in that arena, particularly mentoring young women. And it is China's hope to use her personal story that is captured in Conquering the Storm to inspire young women from all walks of life. What a blessing. And we are so happy and blessed to have China Brown with us on Off the Shelf this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Off the Shelf, China. Great to be here. Great morning, everybody. We're so happy to have you here with us. One of our, our 
guests, wrapping up 2018 and 2019, we are into our 14th year on the radio. So we're happy to have you as Mox, one of our closeout for the year, our 13th year on the radio guests. So, China, for every guest, I ask them about the same four or five questions at the beginning because our listeners told me that they wanted to get a little backstory on our guests before I just started asking them about their books and their writing. So can you okay. tell off-the-shelf listeners, China, where you grew up? We already know in Greenville, but what was life like for you growing up in Greenville, South Carolina? Okay. Um, yeah, I did grow up in Greenville, South Carolina, I grew up in a neighborhood um, called Juanita Butler Center. Um, it started out pretty good. My mom and my dad, they were together, and, and things were going pretty pretty well in life. Um, once my mom and my dad split up, life kind of took a turn for the worst at that time, and I ended up experiencing what it was like to grow up in poverty, um, what it was like to grow up with a single mother, and watch her struggle, um, live off of welfare and off of food stamps. And um, without a father in the home, I was incarcerated in a juvenile facility at the age of 13 because a lot of the things that were happening in my life were causing anger issues, depression issues, and just questions that I really didn't answer, well, things that I really didn't understand that were going on as a child. And I stayed there for two years from 13 to 15. Once I was released from there, I kind of came back out to the streets full force, um, curious, and I got involved with um, alcohol and and drugs and things of that nature, dropped out of high school, and things, things pretty much, life was just a roller coaster pretty much after that for a while. You know what? I'm so I'm so happy you shared your story because we try to put on a face, uh, mm-hmm. all of us, and then every every everybody has a story. Everybody, but we act like no, not me. My family is perfect, and if, if people, if you ever been in therapy, uh, that's something that the psychotherapist say makes the the therapy taking effect takes so long because people keep telling you how wonderful. Everything is, Mm -hmm. and their family is, they grew up in such a happy, perfect family. It can take months or years for a therapist to crack through that to get to the truth. Mm -hmm. And then then you start getting help. But I just, it's just a blessing that you've shared your story and have decided not to walk that path and let me try to make it fit the world, perfection. I'm just going to tell the truth coming right out the box. What did you dream Mm -hmm. of becoming? What did you dream of becoming when you were a, a little girl, China? I always wanted to be a lawyer. That that was my that was my biggest dream as I was growing up. I always it was just a, a lawyer like that because I always loved to read and write. So I, that's how it came in me. It was just always a lawyer. Okay, an attorney helping other people. How old mm-hmm. were you when you knew? How old were you when you knew that you wanted to be a writer? I think I was probably around, uh, if, well, at first I, I thought that I, I wanted to do music because I had a passion for music. But as I continued writing music and continued recording music, I, I just couldn't get the, the passion. The passion just wasn't there. And then as I continued writing, I finally it finally dawned on me that my passion wasn't actually in the music, that it, the passion was actually in the writing. And I would say that I was probably around 20, maybe 29 or 30 when, I, when it actually dawned on me that writing was my passion. Ah, and you know what? So you have to stick with it. Because I think that's something in in the struggles I've been through in my life that have helped me just knowing this is my gift, my talent. This is it's kept. I mean, some hard struggles. It's what's kept me going. You went. You kept mm-hmm. going on your journey till you figured out what your what mm-hmm. your passion was. Who who or what inspired you to pursue writing? Who helped birth that that love of writing in you? I would say um, I used to talk about it all the time, but it was never coming to pass. And then one night I prayed about it, 
and and God revealed to me in a dream, um, writing to me in a dream. And then I was, and I, I really didn't focus on it at that time. You know, I just said, well, okay, I see the writing, but I never really focused on it. It was one night that I was actually in a club, and I was sitting at the bar, and I was drinking, and I was pretty intoxicated, but a guy that I grew up with that knew me pretty well, he actually walked up to the bar, and we started talking, and he just said to me, he said, you know, I think you should write a book. We was talking about life and talking about the past, and, you know, he was just telling me, you know, with all the things that I saw you go through, he was like, I I really think you should tell your story. I think it will be awesome if you would write a book, and once he told me that that night, it was like at that point it stuck. That was when it when oh. it actually stuck. Isn't that something? We can say things to each other to discourage each other, to make each other think, nah, it's not going to work out, or we can say something that it leads somebody on a, on a good path. Now, is, is conquering a storm for those who might be looking around? First thing I want to ask you is do you have a website? Because I want to share your website URL. I don't have a website right now. I actually have one in the making, but it's not completed yet. So right now I'm just on um, all social media platforms, and the book is also on Amazon. Uh, so this is my next question. For those who are lo- looking for Conquering the Storm, is it written under your pen name, Ari Sullivan or China Brown? Those who are looking right now, I want to get this book. What is the uh, the t- the name, the author name that is under so they can find it. It's it's under China Brown. That China Brown is actually my pen name. So that that's where that's what you can find it under. Okay. China Brown, China Brown, off the shelf mm-hmm. listeners. Conquering the storm. Okay, China. I've read some of Conquering the Storm and this is off the shelf listeners, a very powerful and emotionally moving story. Some people it could be a trigger for some people who've gone through similar events. But uh, if you read it all the way through, you may come out empowered. But it is, she tells this story raw. What inspired you Mm -hmm. to put the early years of your physical experience to pen and paper? That took some courage. What inspired you? Mm -hmm. I know you said the guy told you you should write your story. But was there, like, some deeper reasoning why you said, you know what, I am going to share my story? Mm -hmm. It was, I, I got to a point where, I I was high and behind a mask, and I I didn't really I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't want people to see who the real me was, and it was like every time I would I, I was afraid to speak what God was would tell me to speak, or I was afraid to post anything about God on social media or anything because I knew that so many people knew my past, and it it got to a point where. There were lies being spreaded about some of the things that I had done in my childhood, and I would always kind of walk on eggshells when I would meet new people or meet a new guy because there were always people lined up to say, you know, you know she used to do this or you know she used to do that. And my life, I, I, I wasn't living in my purpose, and I was I was hiding. I had to be one way around people, and I had to be another way around other people, and I was starting to feel uncomfortable in my life. But as I went, once I wrote my story, I just came to the point where I don't have to be ashamed of what happened to me in my past or what I've done in my past or some of the decisions that I made because my past is not me. And I, I said, how can I use my pain and turn it into power? So that's when I began to say I'm going to start at the beginning of my life. You know, a lot of people, they don't know the story. They don't know what happened. They don't know what led to some of the events. Let me tell the story and, and, and stop the rumors and stop the lies. Let me give the story raw and uncut. Let me turn this pain into purpose. Mm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, was your father active? You, talk, you talked earlier uh, at, the, at the very beginning when you were telling us about growing up in South Carolina, but was your father active in your life at Early, early on in your life, was he active? This for our listeners, I, I know the answer, but for mm-hmm. all the chef listeners, was he act, active in your, like your early years from like birth to maybe five or seven, was he present in your life? Yeah, he, he was um, present in my life from from my birth to about eight years old. Um, he was He was always around. He was a great dad. 
You know, he always told me how beautiful of a girl I was. He always um, treated he treated me like a queen. So, yes, he was in my life until I was about active, until I was about eight years old. Okay. So did he completely go out of your life? Or, you know, you said your parents split up. So was that mm-hmm. you didn't see him at all anymore or it was just not as much? Yeah, well, I, I saw him um, after they split up. And there was a lot of bickering going on between the two of them. And he actually even tried to fight for custody of me and my brother at the time. But um, I really don't know what when, what happened with it. But he didn't win custody of, custody of us. And it was it just kind of seemed to me that after he lost the custody, you know, he went and started a new family. And I, I feel like he kind of. Oh, well, he did. He kind of forgot that, you know, he had a child over here that was that was living a hard life, that was struggling. So, you know, I did see him, and once I went to the juvenile facility, he was there every weekend. I saw him every weekend. He came down to see me. He made sure I had money, and, you know, he did what he was supposed to have done. Um, but I did, however, I did feel like had he been, had he fought for me a little harder, that I would not have. Mm, and that's the thing, uh, when when a couple is breaking up, that is such an emotional time. And I know as an adult, if you've experienced a relationship breakup, when you're a kid, you don't know what, you, what your mother and father are going through. That is way up there high on the list of emotional experiences. And mm-hmm. you're dealing with anger and hurt and fear and just, I mean, extreme emotions. So sometimes we get blinded mm-hmm. and we get so focused on ourselves. It's like you can't even, you lose sight of your child. And you're like, I just want mm-hmm. to take uh, care of myself and, and I'm upset with this other person. And then you forget what it's doing to your child. So anybody listening to mm-hmm. this show, I hope you, you stop. And as much as hurt as you're feeling, that you still remember your child. And maybe if you have to put your child at front, then do that because they're developing they're de- they're developing. Uh, what what my next question is for you, and kudos to your father for being active there early in your life mm-hmm. when he was. I know you mm-hmm. said it, wish he had fought harder, longer. Uh, what type of role did your mother play in your life, particularly in your developing years? Were the two of you like best friends? You know what? How, what was her role in your life? Well, as as I was growing up, uh, we were really close, and we we were best friends. And but once her and my dad split, well, first let me say that a lot of times our our parents they they are fighting battles that that were long before us, and and they are battling with with self love and, and forgiveness and you know they they they're only dealing with the cards that that they were dealt. So a lot of times we we don't see it that way. And as a child, of course, you're not going to see it that way because you don't really understand. Um, as we were, as I was growing up, I, I just became to I became angry at my mom. Uh, once her and my dad split because of the way that we had to live, you know, I had never with my dad, I had never experienced living without lights. I had never experienced living without food or living without water or eviction notices, and you know, no barely any clothes or any shoes to go to school. And you know, being picked on by children in school, I had never experienced that. So I was, um, I was angry at my mom because I felt like, you know, why we have to live this way, or why can't we just go back home with my dad instead of, um, you know, being out there living that way. But I just didn't understand, you know, the situation between them, and and it became to it became clearer to me as I got as I started to get older. But I. I developed a, a anger in, within me for my mom, and it carried on probably until I was about thirty years old. And and and, and, it's, and that you knew that that's what it was, so you could know right away what to work with the Lord to start start working on it. That is so important. Uh, what mm-hmm. did What did your mother stand with your father after he started to abuse and mistreat her? Tell you about the role that women and men play in relationships. And then this interview is, of course, to share your story, Conquering the Storm by mm-hmm. China Brown, but also <laughs> hopefully helping other people who are right now where you used to be. So what did, what did mm-hmm. that 
or maybe there's a woman who's in, in, in domestic violence and she's telling herself reasons why she ought to stay. But what did, what did that teach you uh, when, when your mother was being abused? What did, what did that teach you about the role that women and men play in relationships? It, it definitely taught me um, that you have to love yourself first. You can't depend on, you can't give other people the job of loving you. It has to come mm. from within. It, 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 you can't. That's nobody's job but yours. And and I I noticed growing up seeing my mom in different relationships that the reason why she was hurting and the reason why she was suffering in those relationships is because she was given the the job that she was giving them was to make her happy, and she wasn't happy within. She didn't know self love and she didn't know how to be treated because of some of the things that she saw growing up as a child. And as I started growing up, I started to find myself going through that same cycle that I saw my mom going through, um, dealing with abusive relationships and dealing with guys that were cheating or emotional um, abuse or or self-esteem issues or what have you. And and as I continued to to grow, I, I just continued to realize that even though I would say all the time I love myself, I didn't really love myself. Because the way that you treat yourself and what you allow, that shows if you really love yourself, what you what you what you are willing to accept, and what you are willing to go through in these situations. I think that that shows um, lack of self love, and it, it's a cycle that that continues to repeat itself. But I began to start going to therapy, and I started dealing with the issues that that I was that I had within. And it was actually the last relationship that I was in that actually broke the cycle for me. When I mm. when I finally when I was able to when I was able to really walk away and say, you know, I I, I love this guy and I continued with with this guy cheating and abuse and things like that. But I I began to sit back and I, as I got closer to God, you know, I just began to keep telling myself, you're better than this. And I was finally able to you know get up the courage to walk away. And and break and I broke that cycle at that point. Oh, good for you! You know something in you loves you because you mm-hmm. you look and when you look back at the steps that you've taken, something mm-hmm. in you even when we go through hard things, you like something's looking out for you because you mm-hmm. you are you you continuing to go forward and and take the right steps, which is is I just hope this show blesses somebody really 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 mm-hmm. really good. Um, mm-hmm. When I was a when I was a kid, my dad would often say, "Kids are resilient." Uh, my mom passed when I was seven, and and mm-hmm. we grew up in the projects. But I would always hear that, and it would make me so angry. It's because my take on it was, uh, and I think like well, when we're talking about when couples split up, I think people just think kids are playing, they're happy, they don't have to pay no bills, they don't have to go to work. So what is mm-hmm. that? They just mm-hmm. happy. So. You can do anything or say anything around a child, and look, they still laugh the next day. So people just mm-hmm. think it's, it's okay, but I could not stand hearing that. And it's almost like kids get over things easier than adults do. But we know mm-hmm. when we become adults, that's not the case. Kids mm-hmm. are just busy playing. They don't get over mm-hmm. things. And then when we get older, our mind starts to process Something that happened when we were two, six months old. Mm-hmm. We didn't get mm-hmm. over it. We just now mm-hmm. processing it later, and it starts to manifest. In what ways, mm-hmm. if any, in what ways, if any, did your parents try to make light of their their the effects of their choices and behavior on your brother and you? That because they didn't want to hurt you, like. You might see your parent, I'm trying to think for myself, you see your parent do something and somebody says, oh, he just did that because he's had a hard day at work or whatever. In what ways did your parents, if they did, try to make light of the effects of their choices to try to, you know, not hurt you and your brother? Okay, well, yeah, well, when um, the the big, it was always, and, and this, this really is the God's honest truth, um, it was always he was drunk. Or she was drunk. That that was how they excused whatever took place, um, the arguing or or um one time she cut him and I almost cut his finger off. We wasn't there but when we got home the next day we saw it. But there was this it was always 
And then I picked up that same thing as I was growing up. I was drunk. I was drunk. Everything I did wrong, I was drunk. I was drunk. Mm, wow. Now, you write about dreaming about future events. When mm-hmm. did you learn to stop being, because you, in the, in the book, Conquering the Storm, it's like you could see some things coming before they happened. When did you learn mm-hmm. to stop being afraid of your dreams so you could maybe even start using them to prepare or to avoid some things? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say probably back in like two th- maybe 2011 or 12, my brother, he was hit by a car, and it almost killed him. But before it happened, I saw it in a dream like a week, for a whole week up until it happened. I kept dreaming about something happening to him, but it wasn't clear. But I knew that something was going to happen. And on the night that it happened, I was sitting in a car talking to him. And for some reason, when he walked away from that car that night, I, it just felt like that was going to be the last time that I ever saw him. You know, I knew what I had been dreaming, but for some reason I, I couldn't speak it. it. It just wouldn't come out throughout our whole conversation. That part wouldn't come out. And once that happened, you know, I, I just continued, you know, I really looked, looked deeper and I said maybe if I would have been obedient and, and paid, paid really paid close attention to that dream and told him that night, you know, that I felt, felt like something was going to happen to not go going that night, that it could have been avoided. So at that point, I knew that when when God is speaking, which is through dreams or even through visions, and when, when God is speaking to you, that you have to pay attention and you have to be obedient because someone else's life or or someone else's safety can depend on that warning. And it's obvious that, that God knows that, okay, I, I can get it through to this person, so I'm going to use her to get the message to this person for me since they live in a chaotic lifestyle or they're doing things out here that they shouldn't be doing then I'm going to pick someone that I know I can get their attention and I'm going to get them to deliver the message for me and I I Mm. felt like my disobedience with delivering that message resulted in him being hit by that car oh take that off yourself oh Mm -hmm. don't do that take that off yourself Take that off yourself. Well, at that time, oh, take that off at yourself. that time, May- yeah, yeah, maybe I don't feel that maybe. right now. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. That's when something bad happens to somebody, and that I mean I struggle with that off and on now. But you, it's hard. You keep saying if I had done something different, maybe it mm-hmm. would have changed, and maybe it wouldn't have. But like we said mm-hmm. at the start of this show, there's nothing you we can't do. Nothing with the past. It's a feature mm-hmm. that we can change. And you know you love your brother. You know you Absolutely. love him. Uh, you mm-hmm. know you love him. Um, that is, but the the for, for listeners who do see things in dreams, I saw a show about a guy in a high school shooting. He kept seeing this kid getting shot and hurt where he couldn't walk anymore. And it went on for a couple mm-hmm. of years. He got shot in one of those high school mass shootings. Wow. And he lost his ability to walk. But he was dreaming about himself, a future event. Mm-hmm. But he, he eventually uh, said he was going to learn to walk again, and he did. That is powerful. Wow, how, powerful. Old, mm-hmm. how old are you, China, at the start of Conquering the Storm? For our off-the-shelf listeners who haven't yet read the book, how old are you at the start of Conquering the Storm? And how old are you at the end of the book? Okay. I'm about... Uh, probably about seven, about seven at the start, and at the end, I think I'm about thirty-four, thirty, maybe thirty-three, maybe thirty-three. So you're taking end. people through, you're taking people through a long, a, a lot, a, a lot of journeying here with uh, China and conquering the storm. And I really encourage all of our off-the-shelf listeners to get a copy of Conquering the Storm. If it doesn't bless you. And maybe you haven't been through it specifically what she went through. It could bless somebody you know. Somebody you could have it sitting out on your table at home. You're not meaning mm-hmm. for somebody to see it. They come visit you, they see it, and get it, mm-hmm. and it blesses their life. What What are some of the uh, some? We don't we don't want to get a story away. We know it's your story, but what are mm-hmm. some of the experiences? You named a few of them, but if you could just tell us maybe two experiences that you share with readers in conquering a storm. Okay. Um, I share 
um, when I was 16 years old and the things that I was um, going through in my life, I was battling with depression and I was battling with self-identity. And I ended up dropping out of high school. Um, I was on parole, and I was just lost. I didn't know where I, I really, at that point, I, I really didn't want to want to live anymore. I, I didn't feel like I had a purpose here, and I was probably even only around 16 years old. And my life hadn't really even started, and I was tired of life already. And I turned to cocaine. I ended up um, getting addicted to cocaine at 16 years old. And I, I won't go too deep into it because I don't want to tell the story, but I will say that as a 16-year-old child, you know, getting a hold to a drug that hard, it it was the toughest experience that that I've ever experienced in my life. It was the hardest thing that I ever had to shake, and it was a battle. It was it was a it was a tough battle that that I had to fight. When I when I look back, if, if if God said I'll give you some more years on earth if you walk through it again, I wouldn't walk through it again. I would Whoa, rather not yeah. be here than than to walk back through than to walk through that again. Um, mm. and I also and I also share just basically um, lack of self love and and just going from relationship to to relationship just broken and hurt and just looking for someone to replace the love of my dad or replace the love of my mom someone to I was looking for something so I was from relationship to relationship and it was it got to a point I started feeling disgusted because you know I'm like. I'm allowing myself to continue sleeping with these guys or I'm allowing myself to continue to allow these guys to touch me. There's no love there. There's no feeling or emotion there. It's just love for the moment. It's just feeling my emptiness for the moment. And I, I just began to start feeling disgusted with it and because I, I really didn't know. I didn't know sex education. I didn't know, you know, to save your body. I didn't know, you know, that, don't go out here sleeping around with guys unless it means something. I, I, I was really, honestly, I was playing the cards I was dealt. I, I was only doing what I, the best I could with what I had. Mm, yes. Now, why do you think that we keep punished? You, you eventually stopped. You eventually stopped, and you just said, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore, and you move forward. Mm-hmm. To understand that we all still on our journey, but why do you think for those of us that keep punishing ourselves for decades, some thirty, forty years, and still it never come out of a cycle of either being mm-hmm. abused, never leave an abusive relationship that even if it goes mm-hmm. on fifty years, never, mm-hmm. never come out of some way we punish ourselves. Either we, uh, I think about that show, my six hundred pound life where people will say they got raped or molested and then they started eating too much and to the point where they can't even get up and walk anymore. And it's almost like you're punishing yourself. Why do you think mm-hmm. we keep punishing ourselves and repeating the same painful experiences? We keep putting ourselves through pain generation mm-hmm. after generation. If you look at your experience, why do you think we know we're hurting? Why don't we stop it? I, I think it's it's comfort and it's comfortable, and it's also at times it can become excuses. Uh, we get comfortable with pain because that's all we know, and anything outside of that zone is uncomfortable. So when we step into un- unfamiliar or uncomfortable territory, a lot of times we'll step back into what we know because we, 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 we're we not familiar with this. It's uncomfortable. I'm not hurting here. I'm smiling here. I'm happy here. If there were even mm-hmm. points in my life where – where I would wake up happy and smiling, and I would say to myself, literally try to snatch my own happiness, and I would say to myself, why are you so happy today? You know, you you have a bill, you don't have the money to pay it. You have this going on and you have that going on. You don't have any reason to be happy. And immediately I would sink back to a sad place, and I would go back to, cause of, and, and that's another thing, a lot of times we'll say we don't think we deserve happiness. We don't think, we don't feel that we deserve to be happy. We don't feel that we deserve to let go of the things that are hindering us or or that is continuously holding us back. And I, I think we are comfortable in these situations because we've dealt with it for so long. 
you know, it's it's been a part of us for so long. So anything outside of that, it feels uncomfortable or it feels like we don't, you know, we don't deserve it. And and first, I, I really believe that first we have to believe that, you know, that this is not the life. I know that I wasn't placed here to be unhappy. I know I wasn't placed here to be um, burdened down with sadness and to keep carrying around things that happened to me in my past. Because the one thing about the past, we can't change it. It's done. And it doesn't mm-hmm. matter how much we walk around sad or how much we walk around angry at people that has hurt us. It's only We're only hurting ourselves. Yes, the past is over. <laughs> this, mm-hmm. And, and it's, that's a hard one to break, to stop saying, if I had done this, mm-hmm. if I had done that, mm-hmm. my, how would my life have been different? How would this situation? It's it, that. All we can do is forgive and go forward uh, from here. How far back do you think that we have to go to forgive ourselves for mistakes that we made, to fully forgive ourselves once and for all so we stop repeating the pain? I, I think we we have to go back to where, it, where we have to remember, dig and remember where it first started. We have to remember, we have to go back and, and figure out where did, which is what worked for me. I had to figure out where did I drop the ball, where at what point in my life did, did this first start. And for me, I I really had to go back to, I found myself forgiving a 13-year-old child or an 11-year-old child. I, I really had to go back that far to think about when I first ended up in um, the juvenile, the juvenile facility, and and what I what I was doing because I I was at a point where the the ju with the whole thing with the juvenile facility, some of those charges I didn't have to have, but I opened my mouth and I I spoke on on something you know being loyal to other people something that really didn't have anything to do with me and I put myself in part of that situation so I found myself having to go back and really forgive you know and I I was would walk around um as I was growing up you know if you had not said this or and and I had to realize that I was a child you know, that, yeah. that you're growing and that you're learning and you, you'll say stupid stuff, you'll do stupid things. But I just had to learn um, that you have to grow from it and you just have to go You have to go back to where and it's, it's not fun. And it, it's not fun reliving the past and going back through that nasty stuff. It's, it's just not fun and it doesn't feel good. But if, if you really go back through it and you follow through with the process and you dig that stuff up you have to, and you start beginning to start purging, and just getting that stuff out of you, I promise the results so it'll be worth it. Mm. Now, alcohol played a role in the lives of um, of your parents and people, adults who were around you when you were coming up. How how do you, China, through your book Conquering the Storm, and interviews, and if you do public speaking, how do you help others to understand the damage that alcohol can cause? Especially being that we live in a social system that adds alcohol to weddings, birthdays, company holidays, celebrations, et cetera. They they did a good job, a lot of people, of really putting the spotlight on the damages of cigarettes. I mean, mm-hmm. when I came up, cigarettes was like, were like glamorous. I, I thank mm-hmm. God I never started smoking, but they were glamorous. But they started mm-hmm. to really young people put a focus on, look, this stuff is taking people out of this world. It is not glamorous. Now cigarette mm-hmm. smoking is not look chic at all. They took they mm-hmm. just took that away. Alcohol still mm-hmm. has this uh we know people don't it's not good for people to get drunk, but alcohol still has this this is what we bring to our happy events. How do mm-hmm. you help mm-hmm. others understand the damage that alcohol can cause? I I just think one with one thing with alcohol, um, I'm not totally against alcohol. It's 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 not so much as it's it's all about how you use the alcohol and it becomes a problem and, and it becomes damaging when you begin to drink unresponsibly and you begin to drive cars 
and put other people's lives in danger. I think that's when the damage part comes. But I, I don't see I don't see anything wrong with a happy event and, and people, you know, socially drinking, having a good time. But however the problem does come when when it results to violence, when you've had way too much alcohol, you're over your limit, um, you become a danger to yourself, you become a danger to others, whether you're out here on these roads and you're out here driving. Um, at these nightclubs or you're getting into altercations and you begin to start making decisions that, that the sober man wouldn't make. You you start to, a lot of people now are in jail with murder charges and, and different types of charges or, or felony um, vehicle or homicides and stuff like that just from out here one bad decision from um, a night of drinking. So I, I think that's where the problem comes in. Once, you, once you're once you unable to consciously make decisions and you go out here and it's sad to say, but some people are sitting in prison with a life now wishing that if only I had, if only I hadn't got drunk that night. Mm. And that, and that was actually, that was one of my biggest issues. Um, I, I was, that's why I quit drinking because I I couldn't drink responsibly. I, I tried wine, I tried socially drinking, and, and I, it just wasn't for me. I couldn't do it. I would just drink to blackout phases, and I would go out here drive and get in car accidents, um, DUIs. And if had I not stopped, and what actually made me quit was I had a dream about myself and what was going to happen to me if I if I ever took another drink and got behind a wheel. And it, it didn't take any more for me. So I just think that um, you have to drink. If you if you're gonna do it, then you have to do it responsibly. You you can't you can't get get out here drinking to blackout phases and you know you're driving, or mm-hmm. get out here um, into blackout phases and and get into it with somebody and end up taking someone's life from their family and and ruining your own life just just because you couldn't make a conscious decision because you decided to drink too much. Mm. What what did you do? What did you do to get through some of the hardest times in your life? And I really commend you for doing the work. You always, sometimes when I watch Yana Van Zandt, or you hear people say you have to do your own work. Nobody can do, do. the work for you. You have mm-hmm. to do the work. A lot of us, we're talking about earlier when we talked about breaking the cycle, Comfort, you can become comfortable with pain. Like you said, you feel mm-hmm. happy and you're like, whoa, what is this? I'm not used to this mm-hmm. feeling. So you go Absolutely. back to feeling sad again. But mm-hmm. what what we some of a lot of times we just don't want to do the work. We no. don't want to do the work. And we, we don't want to do the it. Way. Then we say this is just the way God wants my life to go because yeah. we don't want to do oh. the work. Yeah. What, what what did you do to get through some of the hardest times? in your life? I I prayed and 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 that's not that that's let me just say that that, that pray just just praying is not gonna get you out of it. I, I, I started with praying, um, because I, I always knew God and I always I don't care where I went in my life, I don't care what I done in my life, I always knew God and, and I learned God at a very young age, probably seven or eight years old. And I always knew to reflect back. Any time I went through something in my life, I knew that there was someone that would, there was someone or something that would help me. And as I continued, I, I just didn't want to. I just didn't want to live the way that I was living my life anymore. And as I was continuing through life, even when I stopped doing drugs and I was still, I was still dealing with alcohol, it became a crutch for me. So every time I would feel depressed or every time I would feel sad or every time something was going on in my life that, that I felt wasn't right, then I would go to the liquor store. I would go in and find me something to drink. And it was like alcohol killed my conscience. And it, it was it's funny because I would say that all the time. I was, I'm going to get me something to drink. I got to kill my conscience. I didn't want to feel I didn't it was so much stuff going on in me I I didn't want to live that stuff and every time I was by myself those thoughts from the past they were just racing just coming and I and you know I I would get up I would be sleeping and say I'm not even going to drink today and I would wake up in those thoughts and and I I think a lot of that come when we say you know with not wanting to do the work you it's some of the experiences from our past it's so painful that we rather continue living life 
um, patching it up and smoking marijuana or or popping pills or, or whatever it is, whatever our crutch is to to help us not to deal with the things that have occurred in our life. So I, I think we would rather it, it's easier to patch it up for some of us than to actually get to the source and deal with it. Um, once once my dad once my dad passed and and some of the things you know I, I just didn't want to live like that way anymore you know I just really got to a point and and I began to see see myself as a child again I began to see that that little girl and the the promises of of you know what I made to her as a child what I wanted to be growing up I, I never as a child said oh yeah when I grow up I'm gonna drop out of school I'm gonna sniff cocaine I'm gonna get addicted to marijuana. I'm going to be a promiscuous girl. You know, I'm going to get out here. I'm going to try to commit suicide. I never saw it for myself as a child, or I never planned that for myself as a child. So I, I had to look back at that child, and I had to, honestly, as an adult, I had to think like a child, and I had to think, what, how would that little girl feel seeing seeing the adult me? How would she feel now? Mm-hmm you know, knowing the things that she already went through as a little girl. And once I was able to to make decisions for myself, you know, she already went through enough as a child. And I look at what you're taking her through. And at that uh, point, I, I felt like I owed it to her because she never gave up. So I owed it to her to get my life mm-hmm. on the right track. Mm. Had your family read Conquering the Storm? If so, what were their reactions to the book? Yeah, they they have read it, and, and my family has been. They've been very supportive. Um, they they love the book. They were they were happy about it. I had a couple of family members that did. I guess they didn't like um, some of the things that I said in the book um, regarding regarding family and some family issues. But you know, I was keeping it real. It wasn't to down anyone or anything like that. But However, with their feedback, I did have to look at it from their point of view. You know, everyone's not ready. Just because you may be ready for yours, you everybody else may not be ready for theirs. And and that's why I kind of held back a lot in my book because I didn't want to put I didn't want to put my family out there like that. And I I definitely love them enough to protect them. Mhm. And that's that's a that is very uh, as a writer. That may be a smart a smart move because you're telling your story, and then mm-hmm. they're like, "I didn't sign up for this." <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you have to yeah, tell no your reason. story. You tell your story mm-hmm. honestly, but you, I'm not going to tell so much of yours. It's just you might be in there like little snippets, but this this is my mm-hmm. story, and that's for our listeners who are who are writers. You don't want to not tell the truth. But it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's your it's your story. What have other readers outside of your family been saying about conquering the storm? I've gotten so much great feedback about conquering the storm. I I can honestly say, I I have not got got anything bad about. I haven't haven't heard one bad review about the book. Um, everybody, they, you know, everyone that has read the book, once they got back with me, you know, they let they they were just, you know, letting me know that this story is powerful. It took courage to write this book. You know, I'm so happy that you got through some of the things that you got through because, you know, some people didn't make it through. Some people are still out there. Some people are dead and gone. Some people didn't make it. And, you know, I put myself in a lot of situations where I, I don't even, I was so disobedient that, that I didn't even deserve all the chances that I received, but I thank God, um, you know, for being God of a second chance and giving me all of those chances. But I've all of the feedback that I received has been absolutely great. It's been marvelous. I mean, um, so many people that you don't know what they're going through that could relate that you look at every day and they look like they had the perfect life going up, and they 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 are battling some of the demons that you've already fought you know, that, that you fought. So it, it was definitely, I, I think think it's definitely, definitely um, helpful. And I think it's definitely something that, that to it's some, something that someone can grab and hold on to, to know, because a lot of times we'll have people um, that, that's never really been through anything or experienced anything. And they'll tell you, you know, just keep holding on and just keep going. But, you know, sometimes I, I want to hear, you know, hold on from someone that's really had to hold on. Mm. They really know, 
what it feels like to hold on, to really be down to nothing and still have to hold on. You know, I, I don't want to hear that from someone whose life has been peaches and cream. I'm not saying that they can't give me advice, but when someone is telling me to hold on, I want to know how you had to hold on and how you had yeah. to keep pushing, how you had to smile through dark times, you know. Mm-hmm. Have you thought about turning your story, Conquering the Storm, into a play or a movie? Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely, you know, it's it's definitely something that, that is gonna happen because I, I definitely want to speak things into existence. So into existence. So yes, absolutely, definitely. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking about I I well stories that are very powerful. Um, it's definitely the color purple. Uh, I know yeah. your story is not like that story, but you know Celie had a ho- horribly oh, awful, just did. challenging child. I mean, just oh my goodness, what she went through, mm-hmm. and then. Um, Man, that man who abused us, she just went through so much. We talk about mm-hmm. holding on. And then uh, a raisin in the sun is another one where a family just struggles mm-hmm. and struggles and struggles and struggles. Mm-hmm. And th- th- those stories are powerful. And then you see somebody come through on the other side, mm-hmm. and that, that, really, that really is powerful. Can you tell us, as we come down to the last nine minutes in today's show, can you tell us about the mentoring services that you offer young women? Yeah, um, well, I'm actually just now really getting, trying to get started, um, trying to get everything started up with it. Um, I just really just want to, and I, I actually have my, my first little protege, so um, I'm going to be working with her coming this week. But I, I really just want to be to these young girls. You know, I want, I really want to be to them what I needed when I was growing up. I, I want to be the person that they can come to. I want to be someone that they can trust. I want to be someone that has already traveled this road in life and that has battled with a lot of things that's going to come their way as as they are navigating through life. You know, I, I want to be the person to be able to, to guide them, to be able to, you know, someone that they can come to when they begin to start experiencing things and start experiencing life, you know, someone that has already walked the journey. Um, I think a lot of us as adults, we get, we get when we have these testimonies and we have these stories, we'll hide behind them, not even realizing that sometimes our testimony is not even about us. Sometimes we have to walk through that journey um, so that when someone else is walking through it, that we'll be able to get them through, that we'll be able to lead them, that we'll be able to guide them. You know, and I, I always try to look at my situation as um, maybe maybe I had to go through those things so someone else wouldn't have to. You know, we, we've already, we, you know, the pain, the, the anger, the things that we've been through. It's some young girl out here right now that's about to make those same mistakes, and I feel like I already, I already went through it so she, don't ha- so she doesn't have to. Mm, yes, yes, and thank you for your, your, the mentoring services that you do. And for those after trying to get the ground, uh, you can definitely uh, send me an email and let me know how others, if you have a website, can participate, okay. not only as the young girls or if somebody wants to be a mentor or a mentee. Mm-hmm. And then also mm-hmm. for our listeners, uh, there's, I think, a hundred. Uh, it's 100 black men. I forget the name, the, the official name of the group, but they, I think, do mentoring uh, mm-hmm. a United mm-hmm. Way and um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, because I work mm-hmm. with Big Brothers. Yeah. And that's another really good um, uh, mentoring mm-hmm. program. But thank you for what you are doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we close out, now I want to focus a little bit on the writing process because we have listeners here who are writers or who want to have a published book. So, what writing mm-hmm. process do you follow? And do you think you do you plan on coming out with other books? First of all, mm-hmm. uh, and then I want to ask you about the writing process you follow to create a book. Okay. Yeah. I um. Well, first of all, yes, I definitely. I'm already working. Actually, working on my second um novel, and um that one is conquering the storm, and it's subtitled the recovery. Um, a little more insight on on how I got through some of the things I got through and where I am in life as of right now. Um, as far as the writing process, I I'm a hand. I like to hand write, so I hand wrote um my whole book. And then once I and, and you don't have to do that, you know. I, I did learn through that process that 
to type the book instead of handwriting it because it was so time consuming after I hand wrote the book and then I had to go back and type all of it up again. Um, once I got everything typed up, then I um sent it over. I had it sent over to an editor. Um, I had the editing done, and then I sent it to a formatter, and she um put the cover, uploaded the cover, and and got it in book format, and I was a published author. It was really just that simple. You know, the hardest part is writing. Writing is the hardest part. And can you share with us three to four uh, steps that you take that you found to be effective to get the word out about your book? And I think this is a type of book that as many people as possible should read. But what are some of the steps Mm -hmm. you've taken to get the word out about your book? Um, I social definitely social media, all social media platforms. Um, I did um, interviews, um, gotten myself um, merchandise to always represent my book wherever I go. If I'm not at work, then I try to always, that you know, so that people can ask, you know, um, what's conquering the storm because it's it's catchy. So so a lot of people want to know, and um. Just, just talking about it everywhere. You know, everywhere I go, I try, I try to talk about it. Uh, my job, I have some great supporters at my job. They, they're awesome, and they, they're always supporting me. So mainly when I come in here and I, I talk about it all the time to them, they're always excited. They're always sharing. They, they all um, purchase copies for me. So it's basically just never letting it die. You have to just keep talking about it. Keep even when you feel like sometimes I even feel like. I know people tired of hearing, but you, you can't worry about how people feel. You that's your product, that's your work, and you promote it. If 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 they don't like it, then you just have to delete me off social media. But never <laughs> don't never let it die. And keep going, yes, yes. You it's got, gonna live. Yeah, <laughs> yes, you gotta keep. You gotta keep going. Hey, you know what? That's what the major mm-hmm. companies do. You say, oh, I'm yeah. tired of seeing that. Mm-hmm. Thai commercial or that Comcast mm-hmm. commercial or that Xfinity or AT and T, they don't pull that mm-hmm. commercial. They keep it coming, mm-hmm. and so you you to you connect with and find uh, your right mm-hmm. your right audience. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. What advice could you give to somebody? And we only have a few minutes left. Oh, you know what? I'm not going to ask you that question because we're so short on time. I was going to ask you for okay. advice for somebody who's looking to publish a book, but we are we are down to coming down to the wire. So where can okay. off the shelf listeners? Where can off the shelf listeners get a copy of your books? Okay, it's on Amazon. It's also on Kindle. Um, you can also go to Bar- to the Barnes and Noble website. You can get it from there. And um, anyone that's listening that's local in the Greenville, South Carolina area, you can also get them from me. So Amazon, okay. uh, Barnes and Noble, and Kindle. Is it in print and ebook format? Yeah. Mhm. Mhm. Okay, so it's in both. Or do you have any upcoming speaking engagement? If, if so, book signings. You're gonna be speaking anywhere. If so, can you share? A few of the your upcoming speaking events with our off the shelf listeners. Um, yeah, well, I'm going to be actually in. I don't have all of the details yet, but I am going to be in Charlotte um, on the 30th, and I'm going to be um, doing a TV and a radio interview down there. I don't have all the information yet. I'm waiting on her to get some of the info back to me, and I'll be able to share it once I have it. And um, I'll be doing a, a live interview at um, the local award show here in Greenville, South Carolina, where I am nominated um, for best author here. So I'm definitely excited for that. I'm excited for that. That's actually next Sunday, starting at five at five p.m. So I'll be doing a, a red carpet interview there. Congratulations! First of all, where is it? Five p.m. next Saturday, you said. Uh huh, and it's gonna be at Epic. The name of the club is Epic, and it's in Greenville, Epic. South Carolina. Uh-huh. Epic, Epic, mm-hmm. you guys. Epic Green, 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 You said Greenville. Yes, Greenville. Epic Greenville, South Carolina, next Saturday. Off the shelf, listeners. Five Sunday. p.m. Tyler Brown, go down there and check her out. And what social networks are you on? And how can folks find you online? Okay, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under Arthur China Brown. And LinkedIn, okay. also LinkedIn. We want to thank China Brown, Greenville, South Carolina yes. native. Go down to Epic Saturday p.m. and check her out. 
She is the author of Conquering the Storm. What a powerful story. Please go get yes. a copy. It's an ebook and print. She said Amazon. You can get it, Barnes and Noble. Just, just, and if you don't see it, ask, ask for it. And then they don't care. They can mm-hmm. start can. If you're in Greenville, you can hit her up, and she says she can get you an autographed copy as well. But if you go mm-hmm. next Saturday, I'm sure she have copies on hand. Next she Sunday, can autograph them at the Epic in person for you. We want to thank China Brown for being here on Off the Shelf and for sharing her powerful story. And she's doing mentoring to help other young women not have to go through the struggles that she went mm-hmm. through, although in this world we all do go through struggles, but to try mm-hmm. to help each other not not go through the, the repeat the same thing that we went through. So thank you, thank you to China Brown mm-hmm. for her time of being here with us on Off the Shelf. Remember, remember, you guys, the past cannot be changed. Mm-hmm. The future is yet in your power, and the point of power mm-hmm. is right now. Remember, Off the Shelf listeners, you are amazing. You are incredible. You're awesome. Go out and create a fabulous day for yourself. See you back here next Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. China, I'll shoot you an email. Bye for now. All righty. Bye.